I will just take one minute before we go to the next speaker to say something about the uh, problem, about disambiguation, which is relevant to what Baron just said, you know. In fact, if we had already wiki author, we maybe not have done a small mistake in this when we proposed a meeting. And I, I think this story is anyway spreading, so I should tell it in full. A few of you were wondering, you know, I mean, looking at uh, a program, and so we're seeing Michael Dunn on the program, and some of them were expecting one Michael Dunn, the other one another Michael Dunn. So it's two Michael Dunn working in the field of protein, I mean, sequence and proteomics. And one we know more in Geneva because it's associated with proteomics. The other one in California is more associated with protein biophysics. And, but both of them are very well known. And if you do a search of Michael Dunn on the web with the word protein or proteomics, you get a mixture of both. So the embarrassing thing is that we wanted first to invite Michael Dunn from Cambridge, from the UK, and we invited Michael Dunn from California. So then we wanted also to get Michael, the two Michael Dunn. In fact, we thought it would be nice to have the two of them there. In fact, one of them could not come, Michael Dunn from UK, and the so second one, Michael Dunn from US, finally couldn't make it either. So we got zero Michael Dunn. But still, in fact, you see that the problem is not only with gene names and protein names, but you can do this also with authors. <laughs> Sorry? Exactly, they would have different nodes. Well, not, well, yes, of course, but uh, that's why I say, I mean, that those type of technology would be very useful for in every type of instance you can think of. So now let's get back to the program, and the next speaker sorry, is Jack Lennison. Jack, where are you? Oh, can you can already come? So Jack is the director, is professor and director of the laboratory of bioinformatics at Wageningen, but I don't know if I pronounce it correctly. Okay, university in the Netherlands. And he has done a lot of things. One thing I find funny is that is I would say the origin of his work in the field of bioinformatics, which dates back already in 82, is due to the fact that he will set up the biocomputing environment university in Nibegen as a conscientious object to a military service. So we see that in some cases, very rarely, military things which have to do with military can lead to good thing. I mean, it's not so often. Uh, there is another case later in this program, uh, another day where we are, there is also something to do with military, but in this aspect, that led Jack to start working on informatics. Before he did his PhD, much before, because he got his PhD in 89 in the field of chemistry. And I would say he has been involved in a lot of things, but I mean, I think what is important, we were speaking on first day of the importance, I spoke during my talk, of the importance of service and education and inbound informatics. And I think that Jack epitomized this aspect of things. He has been, I mean, uh, active in all aspects of MNET. And as he's not going to speak about that during his talk, I don't think he's going to speak about that. I think it's important to say he was a known manager for Holland for a long time. He was a treasurer. He was a chief uh, chairman of MNET. So he has done a lot of things for MNET. Not only for MNET, when we go to the geolinks, OK, Wageningen, Nimegen, and Upper Trieste, because there is a famous course on bioinformatics which is taking place every year since 89 in Trieste, and for the last more than 10 years, 13 years now, I mean, uh, 13 years, Jack is one of the people giving, I mean, part of the course. As Bowling's effort, Wilfred de Jong, with whom he has done his PhD working on crystalline, and all of them note, net note people manager because he has been with them for years and years. I put Sondor Pongo and Martin Bishop and all of the Trias crew because every year he has been on that. So just one more slide on you, Jack. Your favorite activity? Getting stuck in a phone book. <laughs> and, you know, bioinformatics can be dangerous. And going to tree, I mean, people are afraid to go to Brazil, you know, I can get mugged, I can get stung by a snake. You don't need to go to Brazil to get stung by something. You can go to Trieste. <laughs> so you see, survive being stung by a spider. Was it a spider or a scorpion? <laughs> so anyway, 
You can have the danger in your bioinformatics everywhere in the world. So, Jack, and the people. Thank you very much, Amos, and uh, all the attendants. And I'm very honored to be invited here to speak at this wonderful conference. Um, indeed, as, as, as Amos already said, I'm not going to speak about uh, AmpNet. What I want to speak about is something that we're doing currently, which is uh, the ProRepeat database, which, as the title Tentatively says a comprehensive directory of exact tandem repeats and proteins. Now, as most of you know, repeats uh, are, of course, interesting features in proteins, and probably the best known uh, examples of repeats and proteins are the polyglutamine repeats, which, at least in man, are associated with neurodegenerative diseases. There are at least nine diseases which are caused by, uh, which are caused by poly-Q repeats in man, uh, like Huntington disease, the first one. There's a number of ataxias, and uh, finally the last one is Kennedy's disease or spinal and barbular muscular uh, atrophy. Mm. Now, the last one, which it is, so Kennedy's disease is associated with the androgen receptor. The androgen receptor is a transcription factor, and for the, uh, the androgen receptor mediates the action of, of, of androgens and is therefore responsible for the, the, the existence of the male and female phenotype. The receptor itself it consists of three domains. We have an N-terminal transcriptional regulation domain, which is variable, rather variable. And we have two uh, rather conserved domains. One is the DNA binding uh, domain, and C-terminal, we have a home, the, the hormone or the ligand binding domain. When focusing on the um, the transcriptional regulation domain, we, we see that we can divide that in, in three regions. And in regions one and two, we, there are a number of uh, repeats occurring. And the T1 repeat here is a polyglutamine repeat. Now, normally this, this repeat is quite variable. It, it, its length ranges from 9 to 35 residues, which on average actually has 20 to 25 residues, depending on the ethnic origin. Now, Changing or, sh or shortening or lengthening this, this tract has important consequences. If you make the tract shorter in man, in male, this has the, uh, the effect that you are more susceptible to prostate cancer. Longer tracts give rise to feminization syndromes. And this goes up to a, to a point where you reach over 40 residues where this, this spinal or bulbular or muscular atrophy or Kennedy's disease develops. Now, I was already mentioned the name Wilfried de Jong. Uh, uh, Wilfried de Jong was my promoter at Nijmegen University, and we have a long-standing working relationship. Um, so, being trained as a protein chemist, there was of course an interest in these uh, in these repeats, and we set out to, to think: what can, what can we discover about these repeats? What what happens with repeats? With, with the repeats, and a good example in this case would be the use of this uh, androgen rece receptor. First of all, um, because there is a lot of data, there is uh, a set of 792 human individuals which were sequenced in a previous study by Edwards in 1992. There is a set of recently uh, sequenced 20, 26 armadillo individuals, which were sequenced by Christine Poo, which is a PhD student working in this process or in this uh, project where we wanted to study polyglutamine diseases. And finally, we plucked a number of uh, 77 mammal and marsupial sequences from the protein database, which also contained this uh, the androgen receptor and contained this repeat. Now, before I go on on the androgen re 
receptor, I want to make a, a step to the side because uh, once you start digging into the database to, to find these androgen receptors and these repeats, then of course you immediately ask the question, so what about other repeats? What is all available in the database? And therefore we decided to, to make an, our own collection, we just collect all the data from the Uniprods and from the RefSec databases in order to be able to play around with that. Now, collecting repeats sounds simple, but in principle, it, 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 it can be simple if you limit yourself to exact tandem repeats. Now, the, the choice for tandem repeats was an obvious one because that is the, the, phenom the phenom phenomenon that we're trying to study. Um, exact is due to the, the algorithm. The easiest and, and best algorithm to extract exact repeats from the database is standard suffix tree algorithm, and uh, that works in linear time. Okay, so uh, there's a little, uh, ooh, I should point like this, there's a little table over here. You have to make choices in this case, since we're studying exact tandem repeats. Of course, a repeat with uni, uni length one and a uh, number of repetitions, two is too much occurring, which would be just two amino acids uh, in a row. So we said the only thing that we're going to study, uh, that we're going to look at are for one amino acid, we take at least five repetitions for the two amino acid repeats, four repetitions, three, three and four and up, two repetitions of the unit are sufficient. The data themselves are stored in Oracle. This was also a good opportunity for us to, to test Oracle uh, because we want to use it in, in other projects and the interface is programmed in PHP. Okay, this is an, an example of the, the query page. Of course, you can type in simple, simple queries like this, a Q, or if we're interested in a DE repeat. Of course, you select What's more noise? Ah, oh, that. You can select the database. Uh, of we have the complete Uniprot in the database, and we have a number of proteomes. The proteomes are taken from the RefSec uh, database. And we have an, an, another option which is imported over here, uh, which is this include ISO repeats. And what we mean by ISO repeats is the fact that in, in many cases, you cannot decide what the original unit is. If you look at the example over here, ED, 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 ending with an E, it simply depends on from which direction you isolate the repeat, whether the unit is ED or DE. Standard suffix tree always starts from the end, so in our case, this, is, this repeat would be christened, or the unit would be christened as DE. But if you start from this end, it would be ED. So what we do is we, we look for ISO repeats, and that means that we simply ro rotate through all the possibilities. So DEF is equivalent, equivalent to EFD and FDE. And as you can see, then there in Uniprot, there are 619 repeats for ED or DE. And, uh, as, as this is a two amino acid repeats, the, the minimum amount is four. So less we're not looking at. Of course, you want to be able to do, look for more interesting patterns. So of course, we uh, support the prosite syntax, like standard things like AD or an E followed by another P followed by optionally one character, or in this case, if I can read it, it says a D followed by an E followed by an optional character and then we get this list which by now is sorted by the number of repetitions. So you see that in Uniprod the longest repeat DE that we find is 21 um, repetitions. You'll also see already but this is just a, a sh short part of the list that in most cases the, the DE is followed by an, either an, an, an N, an D, an E, and sometimes by a, a G or a K. 
Of course, the, the next question that you asked then is, okay, now show me what the distributions of these uh, repeats is. Where do these repeats actually occur? So you can uh, show the, distrib the taxonomic distribution of the repeats. So for instance, this is for the DE repeats that we see that most of them are, of course, in the eukaryota, but simply because of the fact that the database Uniprot contains a lot of eukaryotes. And this, this can unfold so that you can actually go down to the species level and see where are these repeats occurring. Okay, let's do another search. We look for, for Q, uh, interested in any protein containing the word androgen, and taxonomically we want, only want to see human sequences. And one of the entries that we get, obviously, is the androgen receptor, which in this case has 23 cues in a row. Interesting to see here is that we automatically also include the Go ontology, extracted from Goa, so that you can get an idea what is this all about and what are the functions that are associated to this protein. And again, as a, as a sorting or grouping option, you can also look this for, uh, show this for the complete data sets that you have or for the complete query sets. Where, what is the distribution in Go terms of my results? Where is this type of repeat occurring predominantly? And what type of protein is this? Okay, so the, the sorting op options are obviously quite, uh, obvious, like you can sort for identifiers, the number of units, or the repeat unit, the unit length, length, start location, end location, with a protein, we saw taxonomy and ontology, and this, for instance, is the result of the complete Uniprot set, which has uh, over half a million repeats. These are the top 20 sorted by the unit length, and then you see interesting things like this, that the longest repeat available in Uniprot has a unit length of 1,539 residues. I remember this, it, these are exact tandem repeats. This means that the, this thing is there. Actually, if you look at the, the, the number over here, then you will see that this is more than two times the repeat. It's 2.12 to, 2 times the repeat, which is there exactly. So th that is one of the directions, of course, that we wa also want to use this database for to see, is th does this really make sense or is this utter nonsense? It, can this really be that you have a repeat that is uh, there at that level? Now, the obvious choice then, of course, is to, to study this is not to look at a protein, but to go back to the DNA level. And therefore, we link these data to uh, to the DNA data, we extract data from Amble and RefSec, of course. Uh, and that already gives you interesting things because, as I said in the beginning, what we're interested in is what, what happens with these repeats. How do they get about? How, what gives rise to repeats? What is their evolution? What is their fate? Now, and one of the things that you can see, for instance, in, in this little example of these glutamine repeats, uh, where you see that it's nicely uh, a CAG followed by a CAA uh, uh, codon, which means that when this repeat elongates, it cannot be on a, at a codon level, it must be at least two codons that slip, otherwise you can't get, uh, can get this type of repeat. Um, linking uh, yeah, Uniprot to Amble should be a rather trivial task, but it turns out that it's not that trivial as one thought. And it, so approximately 3% of the corresponding nucleotide sequences that we want to uh, get from Amble and then put into the database cannot be retrieved. Now there's a number of, of causes for that. One is that there are no links to the nucleotide database. So sometimes we have entries which simply say no annotated CDS available in AMBLE. Yep, that can happen. Um, sometimes there are no AMBLE links. There can be various causes. An, an obvious one is, of course, when there's a protein that has been sequenced at protein level only. 
But an, another type of, of error is probably a bit more interesting, which are annotating, uh, annotation errors in the nucleotide database, which is actually two-thirds of the cases. And there you get strange cases where what, what, what we've seen is, um, for instance, a gene that is located on the minus strands. The gene is built up from exons. And then, of course, the obvious thing would be join the exons, complement the thing, and you get your sequence. And then we can locate and repeat. But sometimes in the, in the AML database, it is done the other way around. It complements the exons, then joins them, and that is all fine, of course, if you reverse the order of the exons. But if you just complement exon 1 and then stick it to exon 2 in your original order, you get rubbish. Uh, there's a lot of, of, well, a lot, a lot. There's, uh, uh, there's a number of thousands of cases that, w which, of course, we will report back to Amble so that these things get corrected. But they're interesting. They're not that difficult, uh, difficult that you can't overcome them, but they can be annoying. All right, so just a few pictures um, of, of result, well, preliminary results uh, that we got with looking at uh, data that we collected. Now, one thing, this is a, a picture which shows the number of different units per unit size per proteome. So this is actually graph seq data. And then you see that the, especially at unit length four, you have the greatest vari variability. Of course, you immediately will say yes, but, but uh, only at size four, you look at repeats that are twice, uh, which have a repetition of at least two. In all the other cases, you are more restrictive, which is true. For in case of unit lengths one, you will already have to have five consecutive amino acids before we include it in the database. And, but of course, the repetition for a unit size, uh, a unit size one is not very interesting because you have 20 choices. It can never reach it. So there's, there's a lot of variability here and then it drops off, which already shows you that not every amino acid occurs in a repeat. This one. Which is also shown over here. For some reason, the, the letters are shifting. Anyway, you can see that if you look at single amino acid repeats, that there's a quite a distinct distribution. By no means all amino acids occur in the repeats. It's uh, especially when you go to greater length, there are only a few amino acids which are regularly used. So at sizes over 20, that's only serins, uh, glutamines, prolines, a little bit of leucine, glycine, and glutamic acids that are used. We can look at this in, in another way. If you look at man, the distribution, then we have three columns here. I hope it's, it's visible. The first column per amino acid gives the composition in all proteins minus the repetition, so we, we subtract the repeats. In the second column, the brownish, reddish thingy is repeats minus single amino acid repeats and the bleak yellow one are single amino acid repeats. And you can see clearly that in man, there's a predominance of alanine in single amino acid repeats, alanines, glutamic acids, glutamine, uh, glycine, leucine, proline definitely, uh, glutamic, uh, this is glutamine and serine. Uh, now, if we look at another species, like, for instance, Arabidopsis, you will see that this is a rather different picture. So, in long single amino acid repeats, Arabidopsis rather puts serin. And, and if we have mixed repeats, then we have a... Ah, oh, there it is. Then we rather put in uh, prolines in repeats, and glycine is distributed e uh, equally over these repeats. Now, of course, uh, next question would be, what does this mean? Well, uh, since this is work in progress, I have to say, I simply don't know. This is work in progress, and this, is, of course, is what we want to go study. This is what we built the database for. So the steps that we're now going through, what we're now going to do is, 
first of all, annotation of the repeats versus function, which should be in principle trivial because you have the links to Uniprot, you have the links to the, the Go ontology, but of course you want to focus much more in depth. What does this specific repeat do? The next step is a bit more challenging, which is adding imperfect repeats to the database. Um, the imperfect tandem repeats or approximate tandem repeats, as people insist on calling them nowadays. This is, uh, this is not trivial because at what point do you still call a repeat a repeat? Uh, some preliminary work of, of one of my students shows that if you use a combination of uh, things like discrete, uh, discrete Fourier transforms and sequence-based methods, so alignment-based methods, that you probably get the best results. But we're working on that. Next step is also uh, a remote access via web services, so Biomobi, because then it is much easier to do play around with the database remotely, just write a piece of Perl and you get results. And then th that also saves us from expanding, uh, expanding the analysis interface because someone can do that himself. Now, getting back to the, the work that Celine Pu was doing in uh, Nijmegen, the result from, it, so that is largely work that has been done in a wet lab together with, with bioinformatics. The, the results from that work are that they are a bit contradictory, or not, not contradictory, but uh, contrary to what was previously thought. The previously uh, was always thought that if you have a pure repeat, that one elongates easy, and if there are impurities in the repeat, then it will be it will get stuck. But it turns out that. In any case, definitely not for the androgen receptor, this is uh, true. The androgen receptor contains impurities, which of course are mainly CAA, CCG, and CGG, so it's just one nucleotide uh, substitutions. But there we see that actually the, the ones that have impurities are in general much longer in size than the pure, research, the, the pure repeats. So these interrupting codons actually help in elongation. They, they probably work as a sort of focal point where they, where the slipping strand gets stuck and adds in a number of, of new units. And looking at the DNA sequence, of course, will helps quite a lot of that. And also a thing that, that is quite obvious when we look at the, at the variation of repeats, especially when we look uh, do this in, in all the available mammal uh, sequences, we see that there, there is a length to it. There are two, actually two repeats, and if one gets longer, the other one gets shorter. So there, there's a limit to what you can do with just folding the, 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 the N-terminus and the C-terminus away from each other. Okay rests to uh, name the people who actually did the work, which is um, at Wageningen University is Martin van der Bos who did uh, most of the programming, Hong Luo who did, does the uh, nucleotide stuff, Mark Kramer from the computer science department helped in the original design of the database and Harm Neveen, a scientific programmer, supports the whole thing. And at the Radboud University, previously Nijmegen University, now we have uh, Hiru Kape, a postdoc, and Celine Pu, the um, PhD student, and Wilfried de Jong. And of course, his work was granted. And then I thank you for your attention. And I'm sorry for the advertisement, but I'm desperate. I'm, I still need two postdocs, and I can't find them. So maybe this helps. Do we have any questions? Thanks for that, Jack. Look, I just wondered if your um, repeat um, work could actually account for substitutions within the repeat. For instance, you could have a three unit repeat such as um, GDA and another one GEA, um, um, both different repeats, but possibly with the same physical chemical function. And, um, can you account for that in your um, in your work? 
Well, as I said, the bits of, of including the, uh, at least I, I assume that you're talking about imperfect repeats in, in, in this case, or do you mean functionally equivalent repeats? I guess I'm talking about both. Um, I didn't know really what you meant by imperfect repeats anyway, so you, when you say imperfect repeats, you are talking about substitutions within a repeat, are you? I'm talking about, in general, about substitutions within the repeat, you, yeah. Okay. And what, as I said, that's a difficult thing because you can mutate a repeat beyond recognition. And so where, where does the signal stop? And also, and that, that probably answers your question, or at least I hope answers your question, the problem there is what is the original unit? You can reconstruct something, but if, let's assume we have three, a, a repeat of three amino acids repeated three times, and you change in every unit one of the amino acids, at that point you can still possibly reconstruct what the original unit was. But if it goes beyond that, if it's just two amino acids per unit that are mutated, then it's very difficult to, uh, to say what the original unit is. But still you can see that there is a signal there. Okay, thanks. Anything else? Thank you very much. Okay, thanks.